Marnie, I'm really glad this week that we've taken the time to reflect upon the game and not uh, not be too overly emotional like maybe the last one against GWS was. Speak for yourself. I was fine, mate. I was in my feelings. You I were was. in your feels. Last week we recorded like an hour after the show and Josh went a little bit rogue. I apologise on his behalf because that's usually my job <laughs> to, to be the rogue one of the two. So we've taken, uh, we've taken a, a night um, to sleep on the result against Fremantle and we're here today, Sunday, feeling fresh and <laughs> ready to... Uh, ready to t- Tackle the game. Yeah, I'm ready to go. I, I've got my thoughts together and we're, we're going to get into it. But um, a couple of things to say uh, right off the top. Thank you to everyone uh, for coming and saying hello to myself and Marnie and the close to a flag guys around Bay 29. Um, really made me feel like a like a rock star, which I'm you definitely not. You are a rock not. star, no, 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 Come on. No, Marnie, stop that. You're embarrassing <laughs> in front of everybody. Um, no, it was really nice to see everyone come and say hello um, and meet a few people. And it was really, really cool. Um, yeah, w- every single game that we do Bay 29, basically, I think we're going to hang outside Bay 29 in the public area just outside the aisle. I think so, at half time in particular. Yeah, half time. Uh, if we do Bay 29, if you're not in Bay 29, come down and say hello to all of us. We'll hang outside in the little beer area on the little beer tables and uh, we can meet you guys, say hello, and uh, we can just talk about our anxieties together because I definitely did that with a few people. Um, one guy I met yesterday brought his missus uh, fr- who uh, speaks French. She's from a, another little island that I have forgotten. I know you guys are listening. I apologise. I've just forgotten where she was from. A little island somewhere near New Zealand. But, um, you know, that was her first AFL experience. And, uh, Poor thing, what a, what coming a ride. to a North game. Gee whiz. What no. a ride it would have been. <laughs> but that were lovely. So, yeah, thank you to everyone who, um, who, who came up. But, yeah, every Bay 29, if you're not in Bay 29, at halftime, come down to the Bay and we'll meet you guys outside the Bay and say hello. You can talk about your anxieties with Josh and your positive Delulu chat with me. Speaking of Delulu chat, Marnie uh, was outside the ground talking to people with the besties. Yeah, so for those who don't know, um, the footy besties has finally arrived at North Melbourne. Um, I will be floating around the front of the ground uh, Mm. pre-game for probably the rest of the season, me and my mini mic. So if you do see me, please come up and say hello. (laughs) Please come and answer our question of the week. It'll be so good to get um, all of you guys involved and in front of the camera. Um, We had so much fun doing it yesterday and thank you so much to everyone who did come Mm. Um, and be part of the first ever pre-game wandering. Um, there will be plenty more to come and hopefully a few unhinged post-game wanderings along the way. Yeah, um, wow. we, the results can go our way, so <laughs> be sure to come and find me. Um, we'll post. I'll post on my socials and footy besties. If you don't follow them, follow them already. Um, they'll post on their socials where I will be ahead of each game. So mm. good Friday. We're on. And I'm sure all of you will be there um, with your royal blue and white best. So be sure to come find me. But we'll talk about that a little bit later this week. Absolutely. Um, I think that's all we've got to really talk about. Yeah, let's get into the game. Um, One thing I will – actually, I want to – we're going to start off on a – not a sombre note, but I'm going to start off with a little bit of a call to arms for North fans right now. Just before we get into the podcast, um, I feel like when I talk to a lot of people outside the Bay – On the weekend, we're all sort of getting a little bit frustrated and almost fed up to a degree. Now, I would like just to say to North fans, I understand it's incredibly hard to keep being patient. Um, And and even myself sometimes, I'm like, I'm kind of done with watching rubbish all the time. As North fans, I think we have to take... This is year two of the rebuild and we have to just forget about the years before. It's hard to do that and it's not fair that we have to wait this long, maybe to be good again. But I really hope that everybody understands maybe exactly where we're at and it will turn, but it maybe is going to be a slower turn than we first thought like four or five years ago. I just, there's a lot of people who are sort of saying to me and I reflect these thoughts as well, um, that I'm kind of over watching us lose all the time. We love the team. We have no choice. It is going to turn. We've got Clarko. We've got Sheezel, Ward, Lomakircher, Durs, Malaki, LDU, Powell, all these guys. Stay as strong as you possibly can because if I believe, everyone should believe. And I do believe in the team, but I also think it's okay to be a little bit fed up and a little bit pissed off, I guess, with having to watch that every single week. So don't think you're a bad fan for being, you know, frustrated, but... 
stick with them because it's going to turn and when it does, it will turn in a fantastic way. But yeah, I just, there was a little bit of negativity floating around uh, when I was talking to fans and it doesn't come from a bad place at all, but I just thought I'd say that's my opinion on it all. I don't think it's bad to be frustrated. It's okay to be frustrated, but don't lose the belief. I think we can all get a little bit frustrated at times. I'm also guilty of that. And I always say, I don't believe in, you know, honorable losses and I won't accept a loss you know, really, no matter how well we played. And obviously there were huge chunks of yesterday's game where we were absolutely unstoppable. Oh, yeah. um, and that is really, really exciting signs for the future. But mm. I think it's just playing I, – I, again, I also have to catch myself out. Yes, I, you know, I'm definitely the – positive Delulu one um, of the two of us and I definitely yes. do have a quite an optimistic outlook um, at the best of times but I think that we all it's because we all love the club and we all want to succeed and I think we, we support all, it in different ways yeah and I think we all demand you know I think it is important to demand more because I don't yeah. think you want to become you know complacent I don't think you want to accept mediocrity um, by honorable any means. losses are the thing now that I'm kind of already over and I know it's going to have to be a process like Honourable that. Honourable losses don't exist. I'm sorry if anyone yeah. thinks that they do. It's just yeah. an excuse for accepting mediocrity, basically. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, you know, it is really important to demand more. And I think it is really important as yeah, a supporter sure. base that Set we the don't. High. Absolutely. And that we, you know, we. We know that we're capable of putting out some scintillating football as we, you know, showed yesterday um, mm. in the first half of the game. And, you know, we are able to fight back, which we showed a couple of times against the Giants. But I think it's having, you know, being aware of all of that and also acknowledging this is a long game and that, you know, yeah. we want to sustain this sort of success and we want to hopefully, that's you it. know, build towards a long period of success mm. rather than spike and peak yeah. and that's it. Um, so, yeah, look, it, it, keep coming to every game, keep Absolutely. turning up, um, keep getting behind the boys. You know, we were there, both there at the game yesterday and the crowd was out standing you would have thought there was 40,000 people Bay 29 in there. was rocking money everyone was up and about you know there was only 17 and a half thousand there I think that's not a bad crowd for North considering Fremantle Grand Prix weekend Grand Prix weekend sun, yep. Saturday afternoon yeah for sure um, but if you can get to the games keep coming keep showing up support in numbers is what is really going to be a big contributor to our long term success Yeah. so if you can get there get there and you know like we've said before Bay 29 is a great place for you to come if if you don't yeah. know people, um, you can go to the football with or drag a couple of your non-North mates along, pay for their ticket. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot to like about the club and, they, you know, there's a lot of on-field signs that, you know, we are improving and, you know, we are we are coming along nicely. So, yeah. yeah. I, th I think so too. So, anyway, that's just a little quick note. Everything we say, if it's overly emotional or not, or maybe we seem negative or too positive. It's just because we care. It's because we care. We, we support love them. it in different ways and it's okay to be frustrated, but we can't accept mediocrity and the standard's set high and that means it's going to take longer to get there. So, 100%. Anyway. Um, thank you to everyone who sent in the voice messages. What we're going to do this time, because we did get a lot um, and we're a little bit strapped for time today. So I'm going to make a compilation. Maybe I'll put uh, a few of them in here. We'll sprinkle some in the middle, put them at the end. I'll figure that out in editing. Everyone who sent their voice note in is going to get played in this episode. Um, apologies if you asked a question and we won't be able to get to it. It is my fault uh, just timing wise, but we're going to put all your voice messages in. Um, I'd say with the voice messages, let's make them reactions and maybe not necessarily questions because we might put them as compilations so everyone gets their voice heard instead of just picking some because I would like to get everybody um, their voice heard on the if podcast. If you do ever have any questions for us, you can reach us on the Further North socials, Facebook, Twitter, yeah. Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, everything. We obviously, you know, we love having a chat about North and we're more than happy to have a yarn with you guys. So definitely reach out if you do have any questions or come and find us at the game. Absolutely. So um, let's put some voice messages in here and then we'll, uh, we'll, I'll sprinkle them. I'll sprinkle okay, them. Okay, I'll make let sure you do the editing. I don't do that part. I just show up and look good and talk north <laughs> and go home. <laughs> that is fair. <laughs> hey, Josh. Hey, Marnie. Hey, all of North Melbourne. Long time watcher, second time talker here. Obviously, I was at the game yesterday, so emotions played quite high. But uh, the umpires, were they poopy? G'day Josh, you already know who it is. Two things. Uh, first off, do you think yesterday's performance is purely just a matter of we know how to play good footy, now we just have to do it for longer? Because that's really all I think it is. And secondly, is it times one leash the chom? Hey guys, Graham here. 
It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. What a difference a half a footy makes. The word that keeps coming to mind is leadership, or lack thereof. Have you guys seen it? That's two weeks in a row now that we've been overrun without so much of a whimper. The Further North Pod curse. Have Chom on uh, in the preseason. Chom does not play games. Josh hasn't seen a win since 2018. Well, stop going to games, Josh. Stop going to games. Disappointing loss, guys. We had Freo by the balls at half time. We've got to have the hunger. We've got to have the dare. We have to put the foot down when it's there. Come on, we're better than that. Let's bounce back against the bloody blues. Come on. Okay, so let's get into the game. Um, we're going to do this a little bit tighter and quicker uh, than last week. Um, but in the first quarter, we came out uh, fairly strongly. Firing. Now, I've written down what uh, what goals we scored and Frio have scored. So uh, at the end of the first quarter, it was four goals one to two goals one. Two goal lead. We didn't know the absolute belting they'd cop in the second quarter just yet. But um, we looked pretty good in this quarter, I think. Um, we forced the, the first note I've got here for the positives, the, that we forced the Dockers to kick backwards a lot. They... There was times where they carved us up through the middle, but it wasn't as consistent as the Giants. There was a lot of times we did put a lot of pressure on in our forward half and we did force them uh, to kick backwards. Which our I pressure think was, was excellent in that first half in particular. Um, you know, we we sort of just every time Fremantle had the ball, we sort of suffocated them a little bit, yeah. uh, which was awesome. <laughs> we love that. <laughs> like we love that. A refreshing change of pace. Um, but on the flip side as well, we were just on the attack constantly pretty much the whole quarter. I mean, we scored the first goal within the first minute of the the game with Paul Curtis getting a free kick inside the forward 50 but yep. the way that ball I mean Sherry just basically grabbed it out of the <laughs> ruck and he did that quite a bit yesterday yeah, yeah, which yeah. I found really interesting and we'll talk about Sherry a little bit later um, but I think that you know he really stamped himself once again on this game mm. and I thought he played really really well um, unfortunately his opponent was the best on ground in Luke Jackson but we will get to him later um, but we were you know we were winning the clearances and we were just transitioning the ball not just quickly but cleanly into our forward 50 which yes. was unbelievable um, and you know the proofs in the pudding and four goals in the first quarter and yeah. Um, yeah we started really strong our transition was also good we had that good bit of play building up sort of from half back which ended in Jaden Stevenson kicking a goal that Larky shepherded through um, we just had numbers around the contest, which yep. is something which is one of the biggest pet peeves to me with North Melbourne is we run out of players around contests. So yep. I thought that was really, really good. Um, the players of the first quarter for me, like, well, who kicked the goals? Like PC, Steve-O, Zerha and Larky all kicked goals. It was yep. a good spread mm -hmm. uh, sort of in the forward line. Um, the only negative I've really got from the first quarter was we just gave up another late goal, well, which that's is going North to be Melbourne. a trend. Um, Giving up red time goals is something that we do way too often. Absolutely. But then the second quarter. So um, we, were, we were killing them at one point. Now, when I, we kicked four goals three and they kicked three goals four in the end, but they got two goals incredibly late, which is sort of um, – the for a negative on this quarter, the only negative, so we can finish on the positives actually. We missed three very gettable chances yeah. um, in this quarter, which could have put us up by well over 50 points. Yeah. Um, I don't know. We got up by 32 and then at the end of the quarter it, it ended being 18 points. And what what it could have been, uh, we could have looked at looked at a massive, massive lead which clearly would have helped us with how the third quarter panned out. 100%. I think from the t sort of the 20-ish minute mark of the second quarter up until three-quarter time, Fremantle just absolutely annihilated us. Um, and unfortunately I think that is – and we've said this – pretty much all year is our we're going to be strong on the attack and we're going to score a lot higher than we have maybe previously but then going the other way it's going to be really really yeah. hard to stop the bleeding and we'll get to the third quarter shortly um i think unfortunately not taking our opportunities was probably a killer more yeah. than once um throughout Absolutely, the game 100%. because after and i know i'm jumping a little bit here but it's relevant not only are there a few missed opportunities in the second quarter but we came out um at the start of the fourth and we actually looked to really match Fremantle, yeah. and we kind of looked like we were up and about again but there was a couple of missed opportunities Eddie Ford missed one and Zach Fisher missed one and then Larky dropped an absolute sitter yeah um and obviously you know that's also not making the most of our opportunities we were within you know 19 points at one point in yes. the last quarter yeah we were um and so t again to not take our opportunities and I think those things will come but I think that that's sort of this was at this point in the game really winnable and I mean Fremantle yeah. have had a really good start to the year, but are they that good that they would have been able to come back from a 50-point deficit? Probably not. 
I don't think so. Probably not. Um, a couple of positives from the second, I think. Uh, i got a note here. Like, Paul Curtis took a really strong contested mark in front of goal. Um, LDU was much better in this game. I gave him a little bit of criticism last week and fairly, in, in my opinion. I don't think um, you were alone in that either. No, no. But it just comes back to that point of, like, we know what he's capable of and it's, it's just demanding It's because the more. standard is so high. 100%. So, he, he was much more composed while getting tackled in the, in the contest in this game. He's fired off a handball. Um, he just looked really strong. Yeah, he did. He wasn't getting yeah. dragged to the ground. And, you know, he was composed in the contest, which ended up, you know, a little bit of play and leading into a, a Paul Curtis mark, which is really good. Um, I think this quarter was the most pure form of North ball we've ever seen. Yeah. Um, even uh, – I've got another note here. The link-up player was unreal, but even Jerry was hitting little inboard kicks. And he got a – he took a contested mark on the wing, I th- I'm pretty sure, and then kicked it like 20 metres inboard. I'm like – that's wild. What, if, a if Jerry, what a difference he's making. If Jerry this is taking the piss, North is taking the <laughs> piss. So, um, and, and another first half performance we'll talk about as well is Toby Pink, someone I criticised last week, maybe a little bit too harshly, but I don't think anything I said was wrong. I just think maybe being his first game, it was a bit harsh. But he really stepped up in this first quarter. Some really important marks. Spoils took a good contested mark. I thought he was good yesterday. I thought he was really, really good yesterday and a really good bounce back from getting bullied last week. And I think it's it shows something about him i think it's good that he's a more of a mature age recruit to be able to be mentally strong enough to come back and put in that sort of performance after getting muscled last week that that first half or from you know half and you know whatever um i think that football could challenge any team in the competition yeah, if we can ever tighten up defensively, uh, because the only other note I've got about this quarter that was that was negative, we're still leaving players open in our defence, and we're playing a high line, and we're playing in this zone thing, and I don't know they failing to spoil and like turning the ball over quickly or a missed handball a couple of times led to those late goals in in the quarter, and that's really w- was the undoing. Looking at the game as a whole, the third quarter was the thing that killed us. I think you're right. Like, if we took a couple of opportunities in the fourth, we basically matched them. So, North bleeding goals right at the end of a quarter is vintage North, as we know. It is, yes. But, um, you know... It's just the skill errors and it's the little things like that that really let us down. That comes with maturity and age, but we want to see it soon. But... 90% 90% of that quarter, we were fantastic. It was also really, really good to see Jai Simkin um, back yes. in action. I know he obviously had a quieter game by his standard. He didn't play return. in the midfield too much. No, though. so he definitely rotated you know, up forward. He kicked a couple of goals and um, and then through the middle. One thing I will say about this game, which really impressed me, and I, you know, the forward line is probably going to be the biggest point of discussion this week. We had a really good spread of goal kickers yesterday. Yeah. Larky, was, it was, he just wasn't himself. I don't know. He, it's, not, it's a the most disappointing performance yeah. I've seen from him for a while. And this has always been my biggest concern is that if something happened to him, be it an injury or yesterday, he was just mm. completely – I mean, Alex Pierce just wore him like a rag. Yeah, for, yeah absolutely. Um, so, you know, whether it's one of those two things happen – you know, we need someone else to step up. And it was actually really pleasing. Yeah. Curtis got involved. Um, Simpkin got involved. Zerha Zerha kicked a couple. got involved. Powell got a couple of goals. Exactly. Um, you know, Ford came in in the fourth quarter and yep. he kicked one. And um, so I think there was a really good even spread of contributors. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I think that was something that was really, really impressive. Everyone played their role just about um, mm. in that f- in that first half in particular. Yeah. So let's get on to the third. Um, Do we have to? We have to. Um, we're we're, we're going to talk about a couple of moments that did happen. Um, one of the moments uh, in this quarter, we kicked one goal one and they kicked seven goals five, which is just appalling. That now, first that goal didn't come until late in the third either. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we were getting absolutely bullied. So a few things that happened. Um, Luke McDonald infringed on... Um, a Jackson uh, shot at goal in, in the pocket. Look, looking back at it, watching it this morning, I, uh, I'm not sure that that's a free kick. He definitely started running too early, but he was very far away. And I'm not sure he really did infringe. Jackson also put that out on the full. Yeah, and well, then, that's what kills you. Yeah. He gets the free kick right in front of goal. And uh, you know, but I also think a player like Luke McDonald. 
well, you've needs got to, know to be better. smarter than that. Yeah. Um, but I also don't think he did anything wrong. And I think the umpiring in this quarter, not to be a salty fan because I know how it sounds, but, geez, there, there was some absolutely shocking decisions. In the in, final in, quarter. In the, in the last final quarter, quarter as yeah, well. Yeah, as well. Um, they, uh, I've got another note here. They, they started chopping us up in transition. Like our centre clearances in this quarter were rubbish. Every stoppage, um, I think Brayshaw kicked a goal from a stoppage um, right in the forward pocket. Again, he just dribbled along the ground through all of our players' legs and no one tackled him, bumped him. There wasn't any pressure there. Um, and ba- Jackson basically in this quarter became a fourth midfielder. And I think this is where Jerry's game went from r- really solid to... Yeah, I still think he was good on the day, and I'm not blaming him whatsoever. I think but he this was is good, but Jackson, Jackson was the best on won the ground. The yeah, absolutely. He was like a he was picking the ball up off the ground like Christian Petrarca does and yeah, running. Yeah, he's very he's a very dangerous player. Yeah, and we don't have an, a, an answer for that. So he really became that fourth midfielder in, around the contest, and I think that that was the reason that we were undone. Well, unfortunately, I just don't think we had a lot of answers in general in that third no. quarter, and we saw this against St Kilda as well. We just can't stop the bleeding. Yeah. And it only took, I mean, Fremantle probably, and like I said just before, they probably took control of the game from about 20 minutes into the second quarter up until three-quarter time and we had nothing. Yeah. We had no answer. We could not stop them at all. Yes. And I'm not – Fremantle have had a really good start to the year, so I don't want to take anything away from them either. And they do travel quite well, which I don't if I, – I seem which to watch Fremantle. <laughs> I know, and I seem to watch Fremantle weirdly closely um, – for someone who doesn't really care that much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole but, separate podcast. Yeah, Marty. seriously. Um, so I think that, you know, credit where it's due, they, you know, they're obviously they are flexed. Absolutely they absolutely are yeah. yeah, but I just think we, and it's something that happened against St Kilda in the, inter- in the pre-season game as well. Um, we can't stop the bleeding. And I felt... You said to me before we jumped on air that you never felt comfortable with that lead that we held no. um, against Fremantle, mm-hmm. right? Interestingly enough, I, 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 can, I was excited, but I also could kind of see it coming undone because it's happened so many times before. Yeah. Flip it. And I think back to last week against the, the, the Giants and sometimes that game felt so much closer than it actually was because our fight and our yes. our d- determination to keep coming back and to keep answering everything the Giants was throwing at us was really, really impressive. We had so, that for three quarters of this game though. So I, I wonder what it will take to get that mind mindset shift because I think if we have the shift, if we have the mentality that we're the hunting we seem to really just absolutely go for it 100%. Mm. But when we when it flips and we become the hunted, sometimes we just don't have the answers. No, absolutely. And I'm assuming that comes with maturity, um, recruiting some better defensive players as well, um, I think is a massive thing. Like we're we're so attacking and I'm I'm looking back uh, at the, at the back six and geez, we've barely got any, like anyone who can defend down there that isn't like a key position player. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll get onto individual players later, but you know, Everyone who can transition off that back line is awful defensively. I wonder what Jasper so. Pittard's doing. <laughs> okay, well, there's time to move on. <laughs> that's coming up. Um, the only positive from this quarter was George Wardle took a really good contested mark oh on my the 50. God. Um, my favourite, so George Wardle. And um, he kicked a great goal from outside 50 as well. And so if he can, not his strong point normally. No, so but he was, he was good on the day. He, he was Simpkin really good. For a really good one. Yeah. It, look, it nearly got intercepted, I won't lie. But, you know, a good inboard kick when he was running along the wing. Wardlaw was great today or yesterday, whenever it was. And, um, yeah, really good goal. If he can start kicking goals consistently as well, that's like the LDU thing where yeah. if LDU can add goals to his game, then he becomes Petrarca, right? Mm. So... Can we get that? I think Wardlaw has that ceiling, absolutely. And uh, it's really good to see that. He's only kicked two goals in his whole career, but he has only played 11 games. He is special, though. Oh, he's incredibly special. And yesterday we spoke about Wardlaw, um, the Giants. He had a really strong first half and then he probably um, tapered off in the second half. Mm. I actually thought he was quite strong across all four quarters. He sort of had a bit of an impact. So, again, that's just another improvement. Once again, another step up for him. So the fourth quarter, uh, two goals, five to three goals, two. Clearly a lot more points. Uh, that suggests we had chances. Which we did. Um, but we did not take them. So one of the things we'll talk about from this quarter, the ball in the back pocket for us hit the post and uh, hit the point post on the full and then hit the ground and they didn't review it or anything like that. We could see it on the screen in slow-mo. It clearly hit the post 
So it would have been out on the full. Robbed. Um, and then uh, obviously they got – or I, th- I think they might have got a goal from that as well. Um, or they definitely got the ball back and at least put something on the scoreboard. But, you know, it's little things like that that – we're really frustrating about the umpiring today and we don't want to be those people that talk about the umpires. Everyone always says that because it's easy to blame umpires when things don't go your way. But the second half and these some of these more decisions in the fourth are, are shocking. And we did get, and when the game was in the balance like it was after we got belted the quarter before, but we were still only like, what, two, three, three goals down? Yeah. Um, it, it's just not good enough. You know, we were 19 behind, 19 points behind at that point where that ball hit the post and we didn't get our opportunity. We didn't get the ball back to transition or anything like that. So it was disappointing. It just seems like with that, and again, we don't want to be the umpire bashers, but I think just generally across the board uh, so far, we've, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of the third round of the season now and at the end of round two. And it just, I think with umpiring, you want them, you want them to facilitate the game, but you don't want them to be kind of the center of attention of the game. Yeah. And it kind of seems like the umpires have really been a focal point for the first three rounds of the season like they're actually you just don't the amount of score reviews that happened when I went to I went to the dogs and the D's yeah uh, in round two and the mm. amount of score reviews at that game was out of control and I know this is the opposite of what we're saying now they didn't review I know I don't even know if they can review like an out on the full call I, I'm assuming they can't it was so obvious though just but make it, yeah. the right call from the start exactly um other things in this quarter like Larky dropped a very easy mark uh 30 out from goal directly in front. Once again, it, w- it was like three goals, the difference. So we could have absolutely uh, gained momentum from that. It's, yeah, it's very unlucky. Like this wasn't a contested mark. He, it was a very, very simple one. Um, my favourite, George Wardlaw, did me- me- mess up a handball coming off half back. Yeah. Tried to handball over a player, um, got intercepted and literally one kick over our heads and there was Jaya Miss, I think, was in the goal square. For that one, so that was very disappointing. It's it's clearly just lack of polish, lack of polish. Because yeah. speaking of polish, Sheezel misses a handball to McKercha. We put some really good play running through the corridor, and Sheezel misses a handball to McKercha, which is and very McKercha, unlike him as well. Yeah, absolutely. He McKercha would have put that inside fifty, and he's a player I want kicking into our fifty. Yeah, definitely. He put the ball at his feet. McKercha fumbled it. They scooped it up. One kick goal. Well, it's so. what I just said, touched on before. I think like yes, and obviously a lot of us who were there, if not all of us, are really frustrated with the umpiring. But it's never just about the umpiring. Mm. And we know that um, very well. Um, there were a lot of missed opportunities, particularly in that last quarter. And yeah. like I said, we were within 19 points at one stage. And, you know, Larky had a dirty day. And, you know, for him to miss that, you know, drop that sit up, really disappointing. You've got a couple of guys, you know, scoring, you know, missing goals that they probably should have kicked. Yeah. And they probably should have put away. So, look, I think that there's um, – a walk away, I, it's frustrating – um, at the end of this game, I was pretty cut and I actually, it really hurt. And it, I yeah. think, I think, but I think why it hurts so much is because it was so good. And you're sitting there at, yeah. at half time and thinking, wowie. And it, it's how good it was and how quickly it got ripped away and it, in the fashion it got ripped away from us. And I think, yeah. like we said at the start. So I'm, hard and fast. Yeah, I'm glad we're not podcasting directly after that game because I would have definitely had some thoughts that maybe I don't think exactly now. Um, a couple of good things, I guess, in the fourth quarter. Our effort was back and we did find that again. The execution wasn't there, but the effort like we sort of had against the Giants did come back. We were a lot more composed in that last quarter. Yeah, and we did have opportunities to get back in that game and I think that's another positive thing to take from it. Um, Bailey Scott's goal in the last minute Beautiful. of the game was also very nice. He was very, very good just in general yesterday as he well, was very I good. Thought. But then obviously, you know, yeah, two goals five to three goals two in the last. We didn't get the points um, and yeah... I understand the emotion from all the North fans and, and I was one of those. But after sleeping on it, watching the, the, the replay of it this morning and having a few more thoughts about it, it was a three-quarter performance barring a couple of miss, uh, missed opportunities that we would normally take, which is just footy. It was the one quarter that undid us and it wasn't a half of football. I know the fourth quarter doesn't feel great because that's obviously we lost, but we did play three quarters of pretty decent football. And if we could have in that third quarter even been stemmed half of the bleeding or yeah. like two, three goals or like even two yeah. goals, I think we're right in it and we could have won that game. So it's not maybe as dire as it feels, but being so good and so bad makes it feel worse than I think the overall performance was. Well, I just think from here we need to continue in an upwards 
trajectory yeah. um, because I think – Not only are we a young side, but we also have a lot of fresh faces and a lot of people that haven't played footy together. And we spoke about the back line last week specifically Mm -hmm. um, and on that same point. But you could probably really sprinkle that throughout most of the team now in hopefully we can get some consistency in this core 18-ish players. And then you'll obviously have people coming in and out at the side, which I know we'll speak about later. Um, But if overall we can sort of continue on this upwards trajectory, then hopefully, you know, by round seven, eight and nine, we can stem the bleeding. We do take more of our opportunities. We can start to get a few wins on the board. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, that display in the first half... It was fantastic. We'd beat anyone. Yeah, I, I We'd think actually, If we could string not even four quarters of that, if you can string three, and three and to three and a half yeah. quarters of that together or if you can string, you know, three quarters of that together and then you can manage the fight back that comes the other way yeah. in return, yeah. you could put just about anyone away. Yeah, no, I, and that's I agree. Incredibly, that's incredibly positive from someone who's sat there. You know, all of us have sat there over the yeah. last sort of 30, you know, 24 to 36 months and just watched us getting belted week in, week out. And that's, that's the thing, like... You know, I don't blame any fan for being incredibly angry and frustrated after that game. But being a young side, and it's not fair that we still have to be saying this after five years of pretty rough football, but we are a young side and we just have, we don't have any choice but to be patient. As much as we are sick of the last few years and the rebuild starting again and again and again, we've got Clarkson, we've got the right talent. Now, finally, we have to put those years behind us. It's year two of Clarkson. It's year two of the rebuild. I'd argue this is this is the start. I'd argue we're two games in. I mean, last year almost felt like a wasted season, to be honest. Almost, but I guess the emergence of Larky in that season, Sheasel, you know, getting Wardlaw. That's I think, true, actually. I think that's what I take from it. Yeah, it, that's true. You know, that's we probably didn't point. progress on the field as a team as much as I wanted, but the fact we got those guys and we found those players who are taking a step now at the team can step with them, I think is is – Reason to be positive from yeah, last season. Yeah, that's fair. You know okay, what I mean? I take that back. God, Marnie. No, it's fine. Sorry, <laughs> that was me. I'm actually letting you... I'm letting you win Marnie for said once. I was right, guys. Clip that up and uh, put that on social media Doesn't for me. Doesn't happen often. Because it's not so. going to happen very often. Because <laughs> usually I am the one that's right. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> hey, Josh and Marnie. Jesse Stevenson here. Been listening since day dot. Absolutely loved your, your uh, attempts at a kick at quarter time. Was it the game? Um, question, do we liquid nail a helmet to CCJ and maybe he will become what Tristan Sherry has become? I actually had to check at halftime if McDonald was playing. I saw him in the second half. He turned it over every time he touched it, but I saw him. Pink, done. Jones, done. Oh, we were so wayward in front of goal. We need to kick straight to win games. All in all, a positive performance. Dropped off in another quarter again. Would be nice to string together four quarters and get some wins. Some players coming in, some players going out, that's for sure. Like the first quarter, the second quarter, that was fantastic. Instead of keep bombing it long to the forward line, they were trying to draw everyone on the tip, which looked fantastic. Loved what I saw. Half time came. Three o'clock, had to leave to go to work. Glad I missed the second half. Keep up the good work. Love the show. G'day, guys. Long-term listener, first-time poster here. Three things I learnt this week. Number one, I think I may be in love with George Wardlaw. Number two, I realise how much I hate Fremantle supporters. And number three, CCJ has to go. So some talking points. Yes. I'm just going to go through these and you give me your thoughts, Marnie. Luke Jackson bullied us today. Um, I don't necessarily think Sherry was bad at all. I think he had another decent game. But Luke Jackson daddied our entire team. He was fantastic. Yeah, Sherry was good. Jackson was better. Definitely best on ground um, yeah. for Fremantle. And, you know, it's sort of – for them, it's great. I mean, they lured him across from the Ds and, you know, there was a bit of question around his form when he first arrived at Freo, but he's really, you know, paying – Paying, you know, showing everyone why they paid so much to bring him across. Um, he yeah. was excellent, and like I said, and like you said, we're not taking anything away from Sherry. He was really good yesterday, but um, Jackson looked a class above, and he's an incredibly dynamic player, and he's got a lot of dimensions, and he's, I mean, he's athletic, um, and he's skillful, and what he was able to do just put everyone to shame. He's the perfect 
2024 Ruckman to me. That guy who can is athletic. He took a great pack mark over the top of a pack um, in that game as well to kick a goal. Athletic, fast, good at ground level. I, I would love to have a Ruckman like that. Like I've, I've turned on Jerry and he's having a very, very good year. But um, that is Luke Jackson is the Ruckman I would love to have in this team, or that archetype of Ruckman. But, hey, we've got, we've got Jerry and... His helmet. And his helmet, <laughs> which is <laughs> fantastic. Um, we did a lot better this week with the tolls. Obviously, uh, Jai Miss and Tracy and Tabana, I think, were the three tolls up there. Yeah. Um, we did a lot better with them. Obviously, not as experienced as the Giants forwards, but um, all those tolls are still a ma- – defending tolls are still a massive problem for our team. We did a lot better. So, credit to the defence. Callum Dawson, another really good game. Um, Pink was much, much better. We'll talk about Aiden Core. We have a differing opinion on Aiden Core in this game. Um, stay tuned for that one, guys. Um <laughs> But, yeah, we did better handling tolls, but, yeah, we didn't – it's still probably not good enough. Yeah, and I think Damo um, touched on in the preview pod, he did say that their forward line um, and their – the Fremantle's tall forwards were their weakest point as well. Um, And so, unfortunately, you know, last week we were heavily exposed and I think against Carlton we could be in for something similar with the Twin Towers of Mackay and We've got a list spot. Aidan Bonner can still come back. Oh, God. Dylan, if you're listening. Yeah, Dylan, yeah. (laughs) Shout out to the uh, number one Aidan Bonner fan. He'll be cheering listening to this. Um, Yeah, so look, uh, they held up – not badly, um, especially in that third quarter. We were under siege and they did their absolute best. But I think that... It's more on the midfield. I think it's more on the midfield defensively in the halfbacks to not let it come in so quick. I uh, think yeah. there's only so much that the tall defence can do. If it's coming in that quickly, absolutely. Yeah, and they really... I mean, I think all of them were really brave when we were completely under siege. I just think that it's, you know, you need the small defenders and the midfielders, as you said, mm. to kind of stop the ball from at least coming in that quickly um, and just to give them a bit of time to defend um, yeah. because so many – so often they were caught out because it just coming was coming in at a frenetic pace. So definitely were better, um, but I do agree with you. We've, we've still got a few issues yeah. down back there. Do you think there's any reason why we can't play four quarters other than we're young? Maybe a bit of a mental thing as well. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I think we've been so poor for so long that maybe that self-belief, we just don't have it yet. Yeah, that's, um, that's fair. I also think, yeah, look, it's, it, it, it's – I think we've spoken about this quite a lot um, over the past few weeks. We are shifting to this more attacking, high-risk sort of football. It's, um, it's going to be yeah, – it's and part so and parcel with that type exactly. of Exactly. So we know that going – you know, we're on the attack and we saw it so often yesterday. I mean, the way we were, we were able to move the ball um, by yeah. hand in the middle of the ground was pretty special. Um, but then, yeah, coming back the other way, it was just, yeah, hard. Um, I do think that we're young. We're probably not necessarily have that endurance um, – yeah, to that's, match that's it with true. the top teams as well. But I think probably a bit of a mental thing as well. Yeah. We are so used to being so bad for so long that, you know, we sort of start to panic when a team sort of starts to get on here top we of go us. Again, I think, yeah. um, and so we do kind of need that reset, be it at half time, three mm. quarter time to just recompose. Um, but I think with a bit more experience and I think as the season goes on, we'll be able to see more of that football played consistently over the majority of the game. Mm. Um, one of my biggest faults, maybe this year more than last year, and I guess it is because of attacking uh, the attacking game we're playing, missed tackles in our midfield. Yeah, this is becoming out of control. We, when we get the ball out of the middle, we look great, but we cannot stop that ball going back the opposite way if it's not tapped directly to us. I I want to see more defensive pressure from our mids, from from Lazaro, from Powell, you know, who had a great game and we'll talk about him. But like LDU, Simkin, whoever's in there, I just think we need more of a, a focus on trying to stop um, – them just running straight back the opposite way. Yeah, like I, I just don't see enough physicality in there. And like the amount of missed tackles in the midfield area by us, like the, the Fremantle players were bouncing off us like a pinball sometimes. But I think that our midfield, and I don't want to include LDU in this discussion because while I know that we demand more of a defensive effort from him, his ability to bring the ball out of the midfield yeah, yeah, and bring it you know, really cleanly um, into the forward, I think his skill is really valuable. So, you know, leave that. And then leave, leave Ward, um, Wardlaw. Wardlaw does it. Wardlaw absolutely does it. 
no one in our midfield is really that intimidating. No. Aside from George Wardlaw. The only person that comes into the midfield that actually would make me, you know, shit bricks is Cam Zerha. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. With the exception of him, we don't have an intimidating yeah. midfield. I don't know if Tom Powell's putting the fear in anybody um, yet. Not I yet. Think it's not yet. I but, mean, I think, but I think with Tom Powell, that will come with consistency. And I another agree. thing we'll talk about, which we spoke about earlier today, was the – Lazaro, Phillips, Powell debate because I think that's going to be a really interesting storyline for us throughout the year. Um, yeah. But I just think, like, as good as some of those players are, like, as good as a Simkin is when he went into the middle or as good as Powell is or, you know, who even Will Phil if he comes in, they're not intimidating. Yeah, well, look, that, that sort of goes on to the next point. I think Zerha was, came into the middle way too late. I don't think he, had, he attended a centre bounce until the fourth. Yeah. And... I think Clarko needs to break that glass in case of emergency so quickly. They were dominating us in that third quarter out of the middle and he needed to put Zerha. Zerha had a very quiet second quarter from memory mm-hmm. um, and definitely wasn't doing anything in the third because the ball wasn't down there. So he needs to throw Zerha in that middle, uh, in the middle as his first option to make a change. Well, we saw last week after halftime Zerha came into the middle and how completely he changed the game. He did. Yeah. Um, or just play Hugh Greenwood. I wouldn't mind <laughs> that option as well. Um, Simkin and McDonald, what do you think of both of their returns? Fine. Like, I think... S- I think Simkins is a bit underrated. I, Simkin kicked a, cu- a couple of he goals, I think. He kicked two goals. I mean, as you did mention, Josh, he did play a lot, spent a lot of time in the yeah. forward line. He was playing um, off that half forward. And I think him and Lazaro was sort of swapping in and out a lot. I think both of them played well. Um, I don't think that either of them, you know, did anything horribly wrong. Mm. Um, and I think that... Look, I think... Yeah, fine. Like nothing. I don't yeah. have any real comment either way. Yeah, I think I think Simkin it was good. I think you know a better than better than just fine for me. I think for Simkin, um, considering the concussion and all that sort of stuff. But his contribution in the forward line was he very very good. Two really nice goals, and it was really good to see everyone get around him. Yeah, um, McDonald. McDonald. Once again, I don't want McDonald to be this scapegoat this year. I mean, McDonald was fine. He was he was tagging a lot of the time. He's not the guy this year that needs to be running out of defence. And I think people. Still see him as that. So I don't think McDonald did anything wrong no, in I this think, game. I think, I think he, was, he was, okay. was fine after not playing anything in the preseason. I think uh, he was fine. Um, Zane Dersma. This is a guy that, you know, maybe was 5 out of 10 this game or like 6 out of 10 or something like that. He didn't have maybe as good of a game or have, have as much impact on the game as he did. He wasn't as flashy. He wasn't as sure. flashy, but yeah. 11 marks. Yeah, it's He took really 11 good. marks. One thing I noticed from him, he was fantastic at pushing down to the back 50 to be the first receiver of Sheezel kicking out of the back. Yeah. And it's really interesting seeing him drop that deep. I don't I, I don't really want him to drop that deep because he's a good uh, contested mark or someone who's always going to challenge in the forward line. But 11 marks is, is a great result for him. And uh, missed, a, missed a goal he should have kicked, but he, he, it's only his second game in AFL football. But I thought his work rate was really, really good. And... 11 marks in the game and him pushing down in that back pocket. The defender was hot in his heels too and he was really clean with his hands. So a really good sign from uh, from Zane there. No, I think so too. And he's going to be a real special player oh, yeah. for us. Um, I think we, while you might not want him to be the one pushing up, you definitely prefer him to be that over Larky. And I think uh, yeah. last week Larky pushed up the ground way too often. Unfortunately, Larky didn't have a good game yesterday at all. Um, so, you know... Yeah, it doesn't probably impact us as much in that respect, but I think yeah, it was great. I think Dersma still had a solid game. So yeah, it was fine. It was fine. Yeah. Um, I think both of them probably were really, really um good last week. McCurcher, I think, was still good yesterday. Probably just didn't have that same um obvious impact as he yeah. probably did last I thought, week. I thought McCurcher was better this game. We'll talk about McCurcher, um, but I thought he was better this game than but the I GWS think that, game. No, I think that he, yeah, it's eleven yeah. marks. I mean, for a team that. Is usually outmarked by the opposition. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's nice to have a clean set of hands in there. Uh, Jaeger O'Meara was the sub for Fremantle, and I, he came on. I think at the start of the fourth. I think he, when him and Jackson were probably the two biggest reasons why they won this game. His stat line's not going to look great because he didn't play a quarter, but his toughness and composure around the ball, I thought, was really, really good. Every every center uh, clearance or bounce or anything like that, I thought he impacted it really, really well, and. Um, I would love a player like that to be a more experienced body, have a bit of toughness and be able to get the ball off the ground and feed it out. And I think I think he – Jackson was the reason for the whole game they won it, but his fourth quarter really made sure that we didn't win that game. 
I, I just want to give some praise his way. I didn't know he played for Fremantle until I, <laughs> until I saw him as listening. the sub. No, that's a lie I did. Um, um, but, yeah, look, pro- props to, to Jaeger. I think he he played really well in that fourth and um, that's a perfect example of how to use the sub because I'm sceptical that just a midfielder coming on is good for a sub. But, hey. Um, inside 50 efficiency. Let's talk about this. Mm. Better than last week? Still awful. 42% to 60%. Uh, yeah, Freo were 50. really, really effective going inside. Uh, like, I don't think I've ever seen North Melbourne hit more than 50%. If we could, Great. if we can get 50% plus inside 50 efficiency and and take those chances, which we did in, against GWS but not against Freo, I, I think what you're saying is, is true where we can really put away some sides. Um I just can't get over how awful our inside 50 entry is. And we still go back to that long kick, which doesn't work. Frustrating doesn't. frustrating as well, particularly in that last quarter. The ball did spend a, over 50% in our forward yes, half. Yes, yes, it did. Um, so the fact that we just can't convert no. is it's frustrating. Get, it's it's like, getting the chances though. Well, it's like banging your head against a brick wall. I mean, this is the same issue year in, year out. Yeah. Not even week in, week out. Like, this is an age-old thing. Um, so, yeah, and it's lowering the eyes. I mean, like, there were a couple of passes into our forward 50 that hit players, lace out. Um, there was one kick. I think it was McKercher kicked it to um, Zerha who marked it. And he kicked it where he wanted Zerha yep. to be rather than where he but was. But dropped it over the top of the defender in front of Zerha who was sagging off and him. And then he ran exactly into space. And when, you know, when we had the likes of Drew Petrie and Jared Waite and Ben Ooh, Brown um, on our list, it was a lot of that magnetic ball. We'd kick it 10 metres out and a player, you know, one of them could just run into That's it. That's the thing we needed to do to Larky though. And I know Larky dropped one that they laid on a plate for him, but... We don't give him great delivery. No, either. we don't. We don't. So that needs to be better. Hundred um, percent. Hit outs. We won the hit outs thirty six to twenty five. We won the stoppages um, thirty eight to thirty four. The thing, the difference there was we'd get the hit out, but then Jack uh, Jackson would be on the ground ready to pick the ball up and be a fourth midfielder. He also Jackson also won the hit outs to advantage yesterday. He did, and it's something I've actually never really like picked up on until you mentioned it last week and then I was you know they rotate the stats on the on the um, yep, on, on the, the TV at the ground and Jackson won the hit outs to advantage and you know it's not really until you think about it that you're like oh wow okay yeah that there is yeah. a really big difference on the flip side Sherry did just rip a few straight out of the ruck oh, and disposed yeah. of it really well and I yeah. thought that was quite comical and it actually worked a few times so good on him um, contested possessions uh, were much better this week. We still didn't win them, but 118 to 127 contested possessions. I think LDU's game goes a long way to that stat. Yep. He was much better keeping his feet. While he was getting tackled, he kept his composure and he didn't seem as nervous to take on contact and, and cop contact. Still would like him to be a little bit more stronger defensively, but a much better game and a, and a good response. Stat line looks similar, but when you go there and watch the games or you, you he watch was on much TV... much better this week and he had a much bigger impact, A I bigger thought. impact, exactly. Yep. And ma- made sure we won more out of the middle, yep. which was really important. Um, we won marks inside 50. <laughs> We've just banged on about how poor our <laughs> delivery is inside 50, but hey. Well, yeah, a lot of those were contested. Uh, like Paul Curtis, who were a couple of contested. Zerha took a good contested one. I don't think I've ever seen North Melbourne win marks inside 50. I guess it's yay. We won 15 to 13 marks inside 50. Um, clearly, we didn't take those opportunities. No, enough, unfortunately. That, that's a good sign. That's that is a, a good I sign. I think we took, we took single digits last week. I can't exactly – it's like six or something like that, but um, – that's better and a, a, a positive to take, I 100%. guess, when we're searching for positives. <laughs> but contested marks, this is the biggest the biggest flaw by our defensive ability in the midfield for me is contested marking. Well, we're just not strong enough. Six to 11 contested marks in the game. The disparity was much bigger last week because the Giants are stronger in that area. But, yeah, um, we just don't ever have anyone who can do it. Jerry is getting better at that, but, hey... Um, we still just don't have anyone I trust to be able to be that bailout option on the wing. Yeah. And uh, until we get that player, if we had a player that we could lump the ball to on the wing when we can't get it out of our 50 and there's a 50-50 chance where he takes the mark, that would open up our team so much. But that guy is not on the list unless uh, Sherry starts to really stick them. But let's see if we can get him a couple of Travis Cloak gloves. I think that would be really nice. To go with his beautiful helmet. Uh, oh, they've got to be a matching set. That would oh. be cute. Well, they can um, tell they have the roof up. <laughs> you watch out. Your Halloween costume. 
we have to do <laughs> oh god <laughs> <laughs> we have to do bay 29 like and find just like cheap foam helmets and all dresses as sherry one day you can do that i won't be partaking i will be passing you one of the helmets asap <laughs> uh we lost the tackles 42 59 i think that speaks to a lot of what i'm saying out of the midfield the amount of times that we did not stick tackles and their players bounced off us well they just walked it through our midfield so yeah often. but we had opportunities to tackle and we just didn't stick them why I don't Not know. Not strong enough still, I guess. I it guess. comes back to that point. I mean, our midfield isn't intimidating either way. Yeah, exactly. And, and Matt, as much as I think – I actually have never minded Matthew Lloyd's commentary on the game until maybe the last six months. And I think he's too long on Channel 9, clearly, and he's uh, starting to be really <laughs> negative. But um, – he was talking about like not having a sweeper around the back of the contest because as soon as the ball spilt out to Frio, there was a paddock for them to run into. Yeah. And where every player for us is trying to play offensively and there's no one to defend. And I I'd actually don't disagree with that though. I think No, that it's fair analysis. It's, it's coming out of the contest, but it's also, you know, when a ball's coming inside 50, either way, all of our players fly either to spoil or or to take the mark in the attacking 50 and there's no one at ground level. Yeah, no, it's true. And like, does someone off the back flank when the ball's bounced sprint directly to the back of the contest and try and be that sweeper or off the wing? We like, need is that something. something Dylan Stevens can try and do or something like that? Because we'll come to him in a second. But um, anyway, that's just something that I thought was disappointing because North Melbourne's also built on hard effort, tackling, toughness, and we haven't really been showing that with our stats the yeah. last few years. So we need to get back to that. Um, I think so. All in all, we've talked about this, so we won't talk about this too much, but the third quarter was a thing um, that really well, that lost us the game and us, I think yeah. the rest of the quarters were good enough. So to end this segment on a positive note, we did play three quarters of pretty decent footy. I think the so. first half was really, really good. The last quarter was probably good enough if we didn't play atrociously in the third. So. And I think the... <laughs> The pleasing thing for me sitting here is for the first time in years, you can actually sort of start to see what the game plan is and what 100%. we're trying to do. And it's probably something particularly under David Noble that we just – it was Ooh. impossible to know what on earth was going on. I don't think the players knew what was going on half the time, so how we were ever meant to know, I don't know. No. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's that. And, and like I said before, that – that first half is that mm. our best looks like it's good enough to beat anyone. So I'm very, very much looking forward to, you know, us sitting here in the next, you know, five to six weeks and thinking, well, maybe things will kind of start, all the pieces will kind of start falling into place. True. So let's go to best on ground and who we wanted more from. So let's skip through these. We won't take too long. Um, Tom Powell. 28 uh, disposals, two goals, 85% disposal efficiency and eight clearances. I think that's his best game for the club. I thought he was our best yesterday. I thought he was sensational. Um, and it is a debate that has run right through our supporter base pretty much since he was drafted alongside Phillips and Lazaro. Is yep. You know, and I said that you know, um, earlier in the episode that I think this will be a really big storyline for us throughout the season. Um, he was outstanding uh, yesterday he has signed a contract extension during the week, um, another two years it was reported. Um, and so he he's clearly, you know, looks to be the one they're going to look to invest in yeah. in the immediate term. Um, on the flip side, I know we'll talk about Lazaro, um, you know, from someone we wanted more of, but he unfortunately was subbed out. Yep. Whether that was completely his fault or whether he was once again a victim of being played out of position, I think it's probably a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, and then Phillips wasn't selected once again. So, look, if Tom Powell can bring that kind of effort every single week... We've got I ourselves mean, a player. I think so too. I think we all know what he's capable of and yeah. I think we've all no one's ever doubted it no no absolutely but it's sort of giving these guys the space to do so yeah for sure um, and that, that was the thing for yeah. me is like you know Tom Powell maybe at different especially last year wasn't on that list I would have probably played I definitely played Phillips over him when we had Taron you know he's getting a game over him and I couldn't see how Tom Powell would fit into this team I never doubted Tom Powell and I never sort of suggested that he wasn't good enough to be in our team. But he just had too many players over the top of him. And we talked about this in the preseason podcast with Taron going now. Who does that open an opportunity for? And Tom Powell looks to be the one taking that opportunity, which is good. That's great. Um, LDU, 30 possessions, 9 clearances, 8 inside 50s. Also an excellent game. A very, very good game. Biggest thing for me, which the stats don't show, stronger in the contest didn't get ripped to ground as easily. Better disposal. Um, yeah, I would have liked a little bit more tackling from him, I guess. 
Um, and when I say tackling, not just looking at the stats on the app and saying he got seven tackles. Tackles where he's sitting at the backside of the contest if it doesn't go directly to him to stop the bleeding. So stats won't show where the tackles were and how they affected the game, but much better from LDU. Much stronger in the contest. Which yeah, I'm happy stats with. also won't. I mean, his stats were very similar to what it was on paper last week, but I think he had a much bigger impact Absolutely. yesterday um, around the ground and in the game. Um, I think, yeah, he was he was excellent. Yeah. Wardlaw, 23 touches. It's good to see him getting 20 plus. He needs to do that every week, George. I know you're listening, mate. Please. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, I'm betting on you every week, my friend. Nine clearance, oh, not nine clearance, six marks, five clearances, and one goal. Six marks is awesome. From George, I thought I so Wardlaw's disposal was much better uh, this week. Last week wasn't his best uh, game by foot, but um, getting around the ground and taking marks, it's probably the first time I've seen him take a couple of contested marks as well or marks when there's pressure on him. So I think this is a massive Wardlaw game looking back at it. Getting 20-plus disposals, taking those marks, kicking that goal is stuff I haven't seen from him before. I think when he played against Sydney last year, I think that's what everyone thinks of as the George Wardlaw game. Oh, yes. Um, and His I Essendon game, that step he did out of the contest <laughs> on half-back against us, I'll never forget. The streets will never forget. And while I don't disagree with that, I think this was a... Yeah. Bit of a t- already a bit of a turning but point But it, it didn't him. feel like oh, he's come on the scene. It, it felt like to me that this is George Wardlaw. That's what he can do in a game. Well, this is probably the first time I think he's really given us a genuine four-quarter performance. Um, we've had so many highlight moments from George. And I'm not saying he's, – he's always really impressed me yeah, when he yeah, stepped yeah. out on the field. But for me, this was a little bit different to what we've seen from him in the past. Mm. It was a real complete game it from him. It was a complete him. game. That's a perfect um, way I to say And I think that that's – this game that we had against Fremantle from George Wardlaw is what I want every week. Hundred percent. Everyone wants the highlight reels, and we obviously he took that spectacular. He'll do mark. that just because he's that talented. Yeah, and he took that spectacular mark and kicked a great goal um, in late in the third quarter. But I think that from from me for him, I want that four quarter effort. His tackling and his pressure, I said at the start of the year, he's our barometer. And it's freaky that a kid in his second season is someone who's going to, you know, he's going to set the pace, he's going to set the tempo. But that's exactly what he does. Um, And I think that, you know, he's just, yeah, he's just special. I don't know what else to say. Money, I'll say it. We love George Wardlaw. We love, I, we love, I love George, George Wardlaw. Wardlaw. I love George Wardlaw too. I love him more. Very, very special player. Paul Curtis, two goals, two, um, and great pressure in the forward line. But I think Paul Curtis is having a very good year. Um, maybe a few more goals would be nice, but he's, what, did he kicked three last week or two? It was, it was one or the other. So he's, he's either got four or five for the year. Um, but his contested marking is incredibly good for his size. He can play on the ground. But his forward pressure is fantastic. And uh, I think it goes under the radar a lot. He he put a tackle in right in front of Bay 29 up on the forward 50 that stopped the Dockers from transitioning straight away. Um, and it's that sort of stuff that he does better than anyone else in our forward line. I was pretty harsh on him at the you know at the start of the year. And everyone knows I left him out of my best 23 um, at the top of the – at the start of the season because I think his best and his worst are too far apart and I think he's just can be really unpredictable. He's changed his game this season. Yeah. Um, I think he's turned into a much more even contributor and rather than being – and I do think he's got that superstar potential and I don't ever want him to lose that. But he's come in and he's given two really solid performances. Yeah. He's contributed really well attackingly and defensively. And I think yep. that's something that so has really impressed me with, you know, the general – Discussion. The consistency. The consistency and mm. the discussion around our side, obviously, after the first two rounds, is that we just lack defensive effort and pressure. And so the fact that we can sit here and say, well, this is someone that's delivering that mm. and also contributing on the scoreboard like we need him to do has been really, really pleasing to start the season. So I think he was really good yesterday and I, I definitely think that he's been definitely one of our best performers yeah. in the first couple of games of the year. Um, she's all... I mean, look, there's not much to say about Sheezel. 35 we touches, already said already. six marks. He's always so relaxed. Did a lot of the kickouts on the weekend. Look, we don't have to say too much about Sheezel, I think. It's just another classic Harry Sheezel performance. It's scary that this is his second season and like, this yeah. is what we can come to expect from him already. Yeah, absolutely. Can't take um, that for granted. Zach Fisher, uh, I thought he was really, really good. 25 touches, five marks, 80% disposal efficiency. But the biggest thing for me was his accurate kicking out of the back line, Incredibly especially when composed. we were under the pump. Yeah, incredibly composed, um, and this is the sort of thing that we want to see from him. Unfortunately, he missed that goal in the in the in the last quarter. And I don't want to highlight that as being the one thing I talk about of his game, but I think that 
we know that he's capable of kicking goals yeah. as well. So it would be nice to see him be able to finish. It'll come. But I think that under pressure, especially and under siege in that third quarter, he was really, really cool, calm, collected. Yeah. Um, keeping on the defence, let's just bunch Pink and Dawson together here. Um, a solid defensive performance from them. Good spoils. Um especially the first half from Toby Pink. Bay 29 was going mental for Toby Pink. Um, <laughs> Were you getting up and about in that? He's my guy. I've never doubted him once. No, um, never. No, a week's uh, a long time in footy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, us fellow redheads have to stick together. So, no, no, I really – I was happy with what I saw from Pink. Much better than last week. Um, Dawson, very consistent. Clearly our best defender at the moment. Um, yeah, a, a, a good a good outing from those two. Um, Bailey Scott, 23 touches, 91% disposal efficiency. He was absolutely everywhere on that ground. He's running. Yes. Yeah. Elite. Yeah, it's elite. So he he was absolutely everywhere. And once again, it's sort of just a standard Bailey Scott performance. He was very um, good yesterday. I thought he was much better than last week as well. He was, you know, definitely playing more up the ground and more that classic wing role. Oh, he looks much better on the wing. I, yeah. Um, and I think that made a massive difference as well. Um, and McCurchie is the last one we'll put in this uh, highlighting of our favourite players on the ground. 22 touches, 90% disposal efficiency. Incredible. Incredibly cool head. He's had kid. two really good games as well. Yep. I've been really impressed. I think, as you said, Dersma's probably been the flashier um, of the two. McCurchie's definitely McCurch contributed. Has been, oh, he's been excellent. Yeah, for sure. Who do we want more from? The most disappointing one for me is my guy, Dylan Stevens. Eight Not touches. Not a great start to the year. Um, the guy's meant to run all day. Um, to be fair, the stats suggest he did. I looked this up. Uh, you can get the GPS stats on the AFL app, which I didn't know until last night. He led the team in work rate. He covered 15 kilometres in that game, but he only got eight touches. What do you think it is? Because he obviously has the tank to cover the ground, and that's something that I think is stopping us from putting a four-quarter performance together is stamina and endurance. So how, think how can we get – because Bailey Scott, on the other hand, was in the best, so on the other wing. Yeah. You know, how do we get him more involved? I think we attack on the right side of the ground a lot more. I don't know why, but we seem to attack down the right wing a lot more. Um, maybe it's because we've got so like all of our use like Sheasel is right footed on the back and he's usually kicking out. Maybe he goes that side a little bit more. Mm -hmm. The thing with Dylan Stevens, I think because he's on the wing and Bailey Scott is probably there's usually a more attacking winger and a more defensive winger. I don't know if that's what we're playing, but hypothetically that is fairly common. He's pro Dylan Stevens is probably the next link in the chain that we can't do. Like if Jerry takes a mark on the wing. Dylan Stevens is probably the guy to get receive the handball and push it on, but we never get those marks and we never get that yeah. that um, pressure relieving moment mm -hmm. that high up the ground. So yep. I'm going to suggest that his work rate clearly isn't a problem with his GPS stats, but um, he needs to find a way to get around it more. Mm -hmm. I do think he's playing a more attacking role, so maybe that's why. Not Don't want to drop him at all. Give him time. He's played two games for North Melbourne. He's an experienced player. He needs time. Um, but I do want to see more from him. Yeah, I agree. Jane Stevenson, don't think he was bad at all, just lacked impact. Um, he kicked uh, a goal in the first quarter and didn't do much else for the rest of the game. Competed well around the ball, but he's, he's, not, he's not the quickest. He's not the most skillful by foot or by hand. Yeah, I just think he was He's an interesting one, Jane Stevenson. Yeah, I'm, there's a couple of players that... I you don't know, know how to feel... Yeah, I'll, I'll go through um, who I think should be in and out in the preview podcasts. But I don't know. He's one that maybe maybe makes way for somebody. I, I would, I'm not upset either way, but I just don't fully think he's doing enough with, you know, the players maybe we've got waiting in the wings. Yeah. Or um, compared to what Curtis is doing, um, Eddie Ford maybe impacts a little bit more. I yeah. know he's been the sub, but I think for, I'd probably play Ford over Steve-O. It's hard. But look. As, he, as for yesterday, one goal and then didn't do too much else. So probably wanted a bit more from Steve-O. Mm. Sleevo Steve-O needs to be God tier like Helmet Jerry. So we <laughs> need that meme. Um, Aiden Kaur, this is the one we disagree on. I thought he was easily the weakest of the three. Uh, no impact in the marking contest. And anytime there's a one-on-one -on -one and he's there, I don't think he's quick enough to follow. He, he got outmarked on the lead plenty of times doesn't impact enough in the marking contest. And as the most experienced defender and part of the leadership group, I just don't think he did enough. I think Pink and Dawson were both better than him on the day and he's probably not playing on 
he's definitely not playing on the best board, if not the second best as well. Well, this is what I understand with Aiden Core. So we don't fully disagree. I just want to flag yeah, yeah. that. I think that Aiden Core has been disappointing in the opening two rounds of the season in comparison to how he finished off last season. It's it, it's like he's playing a completely different role. That and I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is. I haven't studied it enough. But like. Uh, it's weird to me that he can play as the second best defender and look amazing, but his amazing things he does is more like running off half back, like Callum Dawson looks to be doing sometimes. He did yeah. it again. He made a run through the middle yesterday. I- I'm I'm not sure what Aiden Core is exactly there to do because the things it looks like they're asking him to do, which is clearly be a key defender and stick on someone on the lead and impact a marking contest, uh, I think are all his weaknesses. Well, his form begs to differ. I think. When there is just he and one other key defender, it's when he thrives. I mean, this is the same thing before Griffin Logue. But with our options, we're just not going to ever have that again. Like Griffin Logue's got to come back. Combin's not even in this team. Arguably at the start of the season, they were the two guys I want to be our key defensive partnership. Now Dawson's playing so well. Pink, Biggie, uh, you know, is someone who's going to push to get in that team. You know, I, I think he's going to play every week. I don't think he's ever going to get dropped because he he's in the leadership group. But, yeah, but he I think he's the keep, weakest. But he can't. He's not the weakest, but he, he, the way that the team is structured at the moment doesn't favour him. Mm. Now, I'm not making excuses for him because I don't disagree. I think that if he keeps this up, he's going to have to make way. Yeah. I completely agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Because I can sit here and I can acknowledge that where he was at from in the second half of last season in comparison to the last two games he's played, he's been pretty disappointing. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to shy yeah. away from that just because I loved what he did at the end of last season. But Aiden core as the third man in a three man, in a three man tall defense does not work. That's why he looked so. And I think that I don't know what it is with him because I criticized him at the start of last year for being lazy you know, alongside Griff and alongside Mackay, he just looked completely out of place. So then why is it that he why is it that he can't take ownership as the third key defender? Yeah. Like he can when he's the second. Because you'd think it's a probably an easier job that he takes, like the third best tall, and that will maybe allow him to be better than that player and and use his skill by foot. Like, is he really that one dimensional that and is he really just Yeah, I don't I think so. Like, but I, like Charlie Lazaro isn't and I'm um, just you know, he's the next one we'll talk about. But you can throw and they're completely different players. I well let's understand. talk about Lazaro as well then, but so we can keep going. Both of these guys are so good in their key position. In their main position, they are, you know, I mean, Aiden Coy had an excellent second half of the year. I mean, Charlie Lazaro last week playing, you know, purely in the midfield is the best game he's ever played and he played excellent against the Suns at the end of last year too. But as soon as we demand something different from them, maybe they're just not versatile enough. I, I, I kind of agree and with that. And unfortunately... Yeah. With this they need side, to be with the options we've got. We, because of how we've drafted and recruited in the yeah, past, yeah, yeah. we need guys who are versatile. Correct. Yep. So I, I think so too. And like Tom Powell showed he can push forward and kick goals. Sim can look at the versatility. He doesn't have to just be on the midfield. He can go forward and kick goals. McKercha is, is a midfielder. Sheezel was a forward and look at what they've been able to do. In but terms of the two of them, how much I think Corb will stay in the side. Whether Lazaro gets another chance, I don't know. And being subbed off yesterday, I mean, potentially we now look to give Phillips a shot. And I think that a lot of fans would be screaming at this point to bring Phillips back into the side. Or Greenwood. Um. Well, I mean, who knows what happens with CCJ and how Greenwood fits into that too and where he plays. But I think that core they need to persist with, but they he needs to take a bit of responsibility. He does. He needs to figure it out. Um, and he, and as a leader, figure, you have to figure it out. You've got to figure out a way to have an impact, yeah. even if you don't think things are going your way. Correct. Um, so I'd really like to see more from him. Um, we've talked about Lazaro then. CCJ, it's probably time. Yeah, get rid of him. Uh, it's I'm probably over it. time to go. I I'm think. Over it. Once again, first He's quarter. He's evicted from the Big Brother house. <laughs> You're the weakest link. Goodbye. Um, it took a really good contested mark in the first quarter. And once again, I think he was good in the first quarter and then just failed to impact the game at all. I do stand by sort of what I was trying to say, which apparently to some people didn't come across how I meant it. I don't think he was a negative when he's around the ball, but the negative thing he does is just never be there. Well, he's never there. He's never so there, exactly. So that's the thing. I, like think, I think it's time to try a Sellers or a Greenwood or something like that up there because 
yeah, he, his lack of impact, I don't think he's doing anything wrong when he's around the play, but the fact he's not around the play is the thing he's doing wrong. This so, side needs Hugh Greenwood so badly. It's not Yeah, and I, and I genuinely agree with you. Not even a from a Hugh Greenwood stand point of view. It's like I said um, – I th- oh, did I say this to people yesterday? It was another podcast. Hugh Greenwood, I said this in the last podcast, Hugh Greenwood in that midfield would have brought so much toughness. I'm not fully convinced of Hugh in the forward line at AFL level. I, I, I'm not going to be upset if we see it, but I think still he's got so much to give for our team and in that midfield. Like you've got a 32-year-old Hugh Greenwood who's tough in and under. He's the closest thing to Cunnington we have. And getting it out to Wardlaw, to Sheasel, to Powell, to LDU is going to be a much better combination. I think so. we're crying out for a little bit of leadership as well. I mean, unfortunately, Core's not really bringing that. Larky was, you know, just he really can only do so much handled though. yesterday. Simkin and McDonald are both a little bit fragile. And they'll be okay, you know, as they get a bit more game time. But, I mean, I don't yeah. need to say any more on Hugh Greenwood than I already have (laughs) in the past. Everyone's sick of me talking about it. But I will say, last night on the way home, uh, I took the train yesterday, which is so unlike me. (sighs) But coming home, um, I met this guy, Wally, on the train. He was cooked. Um, But he was an all supporter and he agreed with me that Hugh Greenwood was also his favourite player. Oh, wow. There's Um, another one. There's another one. And he said to me, I really think that Hugh Greenwood should be playing and why isn't he playing? And I said, mate, that's a question I ask every week on the podcast. So, Wally, if you are listening, uh, you know, I'm campaigning for this every single week and uh, hopefully it's a good, good Friday for me with Hugh Greenwood back in the side. Um, the last one we'll talk about is Larky. Probably not his best game. Obviously not dropping Nick Larky ever. <laughs> um, and he's a star and I love Nick Larky. But yeah, um, once again, that leadership thing, I, I, we really wanted him to step up yesterday. And I'm not saying it's his fault. Are uh, we making some excuses for Larky because we love him so much potentially? But um, yeah, not not quite good enough from, from but Nick. But also I think on the flip side, you can't expect him to carry the forward line week in, week out. We've been no, no, so he needs fortunate help. last season yeah. that he did that for yeah. us. But God forbid he goes down with an injury. God forbid, you know, he has a quiet game and he was so well covered, like we said by Pierce yesterday. Um, we were lucky yesterday at a very even spread of contributors. We had mul- multiple, multiple goal, goal scorers. Yeah. Um, but we just do really need, you know. Yeah. We need a solid right-hand man for him. So I think Greenwood should be next in line to get a shot. But whether we bypass him and bring in Sellers, I don't know what the answer is. But Mm. I hope that change is made this week. Fair enough. Okay. um, Lastly, to finish Sean Atley Club champ votes, we're giving three to Tom Powell, two to LDU and one to George Wardlaw. You guys will be pleased to know this was unanimous. This week. It was unanimous. Shout out to Fisher and Paul Curtis. I've put there. I think they were maybe next in line for a couple of votes. And probably Bailey Scott. You can Bailey chuck Scott, in there as well. You can throw a few, but um, they're the ones we're going with, so we'll update that. Um, I was going to talk a little bit of VFL, like incredibly quickly. I'll just try and uh, find the website here. Um, Sellers kicked six. He which did. Which was fantastic. Excellent. Um, game from fantastic him. games from like a Bergman. Uh, let me get the disposals up here. How do we find this? Yeah. Um, Liam Shields had 33 disposals. Will Phillips, 30 touches. Bergman, 29. Really composed at the back. Um, Sellers, uh, kicking six, like we said. Um, Combin, uh, I think I watched a little bit of it. Did get a little bit um, outmarked sometimes, but his, uh, reports are he's still solid down there. So we did beat the uh, the Northern Bull ads 81 to 42. So it was a comprehensive win in the end that, um, by our VFL nice. side, which was lovely. So just quickly to touch, because we do have to just finish up, but um, we're trying to keep the podcast a little bit shorter. We do love to chat though, as you guys know. Absolutely. So we'll wrap it up here. Um, we'll talk uh, more in the preview podcast, but um, – Thank you for coming on again, Marnie, and uh, dissecting all of that performance. Thank you for having me. If you guys don't follow us already on socials, Further North Pod on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. Hi, YouTube. Hi, YouTube. Um, and we'll be I back. have a new haircut. Should you I point that out? I'm trialing a new haircut. It's all got to grow, so don't Let rush me in the comments too much. Let us know what you think of Josh's haircut Please in the don't. comments below. Um, it's a work in progress. Give me three months. We have a very, very special uh, preview episode coming up on Friday, or ahead of the Good Friday Clash, I should say, against Carl. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's, we'll see you guys then, I guess. 
Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, preview podcast. Carlton Besties are on, so that's very, very exciting. Very exciting. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening us uh, to us again. Hopefully, we're all remaining positive. I feel like this is a fairly positive podcast. Um, fair that's criticism. That's nice and different from you. Yeah, well, it knew you knew me, <laughs> Marnie. I, I, uh, my, my form matches Toby Pink's form. So if Toby Pink plays well, I podcast well. We're the same. Every redhead is the same. We all know we're connected. No pressure, Toby, but keep up the good work, please. Absolutely. Um, I'm, okay, that's enough, Toby Pink Chat. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We will see you next week. Have fun and footy is cool. Bye, guys. <laughs>